lesson 37. The subject of this lesson is actually the subject of lesson 40, I explained last week. It's a major exercise. Um, it's an important exercise, a powerful exercise. And I decided to pull it back to lesson 37 so that we can at least practice it together a couple of times before the end of the course. In the advanced course, which exists out of three modules as long as this one, so the first 40 classes of the advanced course, you practice Sabhati Mudra every class, with every meditation. So it's a major exercise. Um, and yet actually it's rather simple. If you have followed so far uh, what yoga is about, um, the principle of energy, that energy has a tendency to condense, leading us to function basically on the lower emotions and desires, and that there is the possibility to counter this condensation by, by by doing things in a very specific way. And that specific way is, of course, yoga. Yoga is designed to let energy rise. And when that happens, it fuels the intellect, it opens the heart, it fuels the intellect, and it opens the crown chakra. An awakening of consciousness occurs that gives you that gives you unparalleled insight, wisdom. Um, your, your intuition will improve uh, considerably as a result of that development. And it all sounds very impressive, maybe. It's something that everybody, when hearing about it, when learning about it, would want. But few of us think that that is actually realistic. But I'm telling you, it's much easier than you think. All you have to do is practice yoga and do it correctly. The effect of energy rising starts already when you do asana correctly, standing still, while actively engaging in the posture. Once you have started laying the foundation, you then start adding exercises that actually take control of the process more and more and in more powerful ways. That is why we have introduced pranayama, based on which the possibility occurs that you change your condition at will. Sambhavi Mudra is an exercise in which you very systematically stimulate energy to rise from the bottom to the top. It is also referred to as a stairway to heaven. Heaven being the crown chakra, of course. Seventh heaven or the seventh chakra from the bottom going up. It's the seventh chakra. In the scriptures, Sambhavi Mudra is described as follows. Cover your ears, cover your eyes, cover your nose, cover your upper lip and cover your lower lip. And if you do that, you will reach enlightenment. Maybe if you, um, if you travel through India, you, did, you visit uh, temples, you might actually see uh, statues or little statuettes in which you see an image indeed covering the ears, the eyes, the nostrils and the lips. Well, the question 
if you are the least bit skeptical, the question is, how does that lead to enlightenment? How does that lead to the enormous uh, rise of Kundalini that leads to the enormous development, awakening, and then further expanding consciousness? The answer is, it doesn't. It's like everything else that is described in the yoga scriptures, it's symbolical language. Many times we are told that this should all be kept secret. Sambhavi Mudra being such a powerful exercise is not just going to be explained without any holding back. Just like we have seen with pranayama and with kriya. If you do not have guidance from, from somebody who has been properly initiated into the secrets of yoga, those texts do not make any sense. And if you do try to do literally what the symbolical test, text is telling you to do, it will lead to self-harm, especially we have seen that with the Kriya exercises, but also with Pranayama, you just, you just cannot hold your breath for so long. It's simply impossible if you follow the instructions literally. Sambhavi Mudra, Ajita used to say, a child can do it. And he said that actually with most fantastic exercises in yoga. A child can do it. Adults often can't. Why? Because the older we get, the more skeptical we become. The more we become what is in the Bible called doubting Thomases. We become doubting Thomases. Because we don't believe in energy. We don't believe in the power of thought being used to control energy, to generate energy, to let energy rise. You have been gradually introduced to that idea and hopefully at this point, at this point you're not skeptical anymore. You're not a doubting Thomas anymore. But the reason why Ajita always says a child can do it, that is because children have no skepticism. If you tell a child to imagine something, they close their eyes and they just dream away. And you can let them dream away on the most fantastic non-existing things that you tell them. And that is how we should approach this. This is how you should approach um, the subtle aspects of yoga, energy control. Because you can't touch it, you can't feel it, you can't smell it, you can't hear it, you can't taste it. But you can eventually, when you get used to the new concept, you can feel energy. When you're angry, that's energy. The urge to go to the toilet, that's energy. When you're hungry, that's energy. Everything related to how we function is in fact energy. And there's a whole, just a whole new way of looking at ourselves and the world around us. You feel you can clearly feel, if you practice yoga correctly, that your condition changes, which is energy. You can feel that when you're restless, or unstable, or emotional, which is all energy, a vibration, you practice yoga, or you sit down with your eyes closed for a while, or you do a pranayama, you feel that you're your mood is changing, your energy 
in fact, is changing. Well, before yoga, this was something that you had no control over. It just happened as a result of the changing circumstances you find yourself in, in your daily life routines. Now that you understand how it works, you can take control of those changes regardless of the circumstances that you find yourself in. Being able to do that, that is truly what means mastership. Sambhavi Mudra, <clears throat> if you pay attention to what we learned when we studied the, yoga, the, 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 the chakras, you notice that each of the chakras is related to one of the senses. Muladhara chakra is related to smell. Or, we can turn it around, the smell function is connected with Muladhara chakra. The taste function is related to Svadhisthana chakra. While the eye function is related to Manipura chakra and touch the skin, the feeling of touch, is related to the heart chakra and hearing is related to the throat chakra. Can you see where this is going? Close your ears, your eyes, your nostrils, your upper lips and your lower lips. You have just closed you have just put your fingers on those five senses related to the chakras. So this is not about your senses, this is not about your hearing, your eyes, your smell, or your touch, or your taste. This is about the chakras. And you start from the bottom. With Muladhara chakra, not by putting your fingers on your senses, but by using an emotion. Now, if you read the handout, you read somewhere that there is no clear description anywhere in the, in the yoga books, yoga scriptures, the holy scriptures, that describes Sambhavi Mudra clearly. Sambhavi Mudra is described in chapter 4 of the Hatha Yoga Pratipika. But it doesn't explain clearly how it works. How do we know? We had in the Netherlands, for a couple of years, we were accompanied by a Swami from Kathmandu in Nepal. He has lived and traveled around Europe especially and spread yoga initiated people into the secrets of yoga. And one of those secrets that he shared with us was the secret of the fingers. He explained how it worked and what it meant. What is behind the symbolical language of those texts. This uh, Swami, Swami Yogananand Bharati, um, he just passed away uh, two years ago, I think. I've, I've been throughout the years, I've been trying to find him on the internet and I couldn't, but last, in the previous course, the one before this one, we had a very smart student, very smart with computers, <laughs> searching, and he found him in France, Southern France. The website still exists and, and uh, um, that community that he created there still exists, but he passed away uh, two years ago. Uh, there, there's an interview with him also on YouTube uh, just a couple of weeks before he actually passed away. Um, so that, that's how we, how we uh, became initiated into this amazing uh, and powerful technique. And again, I say a child can do it. It's so simple that a child can actually do it. But you have to believe it, really, as a skeptical adult. It's so simple that you would say, 
wow, this is, this is just, you're kidding, right? How does it work? You have to visualize, of course. You know that um, you have to visualize the chakras, okay? You have six chakras. Um, Asana chakra is usually a diamond, symbolically, because of the importance of the intellect. And, and um, the crown chakra is usually pictured as a flame. <laughs> Does it look like a flame? <laughs> It's more like an apostrophe or something. Anyway, that's not the point. Energy has a tendency to, to condense towards the bottom. Samadhi Mudra makes that energy rise. Everything in yoga is designed to make that energy rise, but Samadhi Mudra is, is the, 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 the typical exercise to, to reinforce that process, to do it in a very powerful way. That's also the reason why for one year or for one semester, it is part of our daily practice. To make energy rise and fuel the higher chakras, the chakras above the diaphragm, the heart, the throat, the intellect, and the location of insight and wisdom. And there's a reason why uh, the symbol for the crown chakra is a flame because it represents light. Light as opposed to darkness. Darkness is ignorance. Light, there is a celebration in India. Diwali is the celebration of light. It's not literally light or fire that they celebrate, although symbolically we light candles and what have you, just like with Christmas, it's a celebration of wisdom, insight. Awakening, opposite to ignorance, the condition in which we are born and most people remain. We start at the bottom with Muladhara Chakra. It's described very systematically in the handout. I, I deliberately skip the explanation on page one and the first half of page two, because we have talked about this so often already. It's just the technicalities of Shiva and Shakti, the conditions of Tamas and Rajas, the third channel uh, um, um, through which the energy rises up, the Kundalini rises up. You, you know all that already. We don't really have to talk about that anymore. What the Swami told us about the finger is the following. You see this in the middle of page two. The thumb represents security, solidity, sense. That is a sense, that is an emotion, a sense of stability, security. The index finger represents ego. The middle finger stands for pride, as you well know. The ring finger stands for faithfulness, so we, that is also why we put a golden ring when we make our wedding vows. And the little finger represents artistry. So here they are described from the thumb down to the, to the little finger. But that is not the order in which we stimulate the chakras because we start with the middle finger that is the one covering the nostrils, smell, Muladhara Chakra, the one at the bottom. How do we stimulate Muladhara Chakra? We do that with a sense of pride. You know the symbol of the middle finger is universal. What is behind? That gesture, pride, it really is. Invoke a sense of pride in you, a sense of haughtiness. With your eyes closed, you actually really try to dream that feeling. And 
you will stimulate energy in Muladhara Chakra. It touches Muladhara Chakra, energy starts to expand as opposed to condense. And energy that expands rises up, while energy that condenses descends. And that's exactly what we want. We want to stimulate the chakra so that rajas occurs, energy starts to expand and rise up, and it then goes to the next level. Svadhisthana chakra is the water center, is related to taste. You cover your under lips with your pinkies, representing taste. Artistry is the emotion or feeling sense related to the pinky. Don't ask me why. I can explain about the middle finger, the ring finger, the thumb, and but the pinky, why that is, because it's small and crooked, Ajita used to say, but I don't see the link. But anyway, that is not so important. How it works is important. Um, you use a sense of beauty to stimulate Swadhisthana Chakra. For me, I have always used the image of a dahlia. You know what a dahlia is? A dahlia is a flower, a big, a big flower, and it exists out of many petals. It has a very velvety texture, and if you look at it, if you contemplate the flower, you see all these wonderful shades of color. It's one color, but you see all these wonderful shades of color within it. And the one that really impressed me, I had them on my, on my veranda, on my balcony in the Netherlands. I had a container hanging on the, on the, on the, on the balustrade, what you call that in English, the, the, the fence. And um, I had a, a bunch of uh, these wine, wine red dahlias. And it touched me so deep that ever since I've always used that image to stimulate taste. And it's the reason why these colors are wine, why these cushions are wine red. It's no coincidence, this color. Like for a yogi, nothing is a coincidence. Everything has a reason and a purpose. I chose this color because that's the color I use to stimulate Svadhisthana Chakra. The purpose of beauty is to civilize people, to melt, to melt you. That is why countries that become wealthy they have spare money. What do they do when they have spare money? They build museums and galleries where people for free or at a very low cost can enjoy beauty. You go there to soak up a sense of beauty. It, it cultivates people. It cultivates the good in people. That is why governments subsidize art. That is why museum visits are most of the times, unless it's a private museum. But government museums are generally cheap and often they are for free. Because the government has every reason to want people to visit so that their behavior improves, so that they become more human and compassionate and considerate. For me, the Dahlia works because I had that kind of epiphany one day, looking at that flower and being soaked up by it. But each of you will have to find something in your life that impressed you because of its beauty. 
You know, in the Netherlands, in the Netherlands, uh, Netherlands is a country of flowers. When I came to Korea and Korean people didn't know so much yet about the Netherlands, while Dutch people didn't know much about Korea. When I met people and they would ask, where are you from? And I said, I'm from the Netherlands. There were always two things they would say, tulips and windmills. Now they know a lot more, of course, and Dutch people know a lot more about Korea. But we are the country of flowers. In the Netherlands, if you go to a shopping mall, a shopping center, there's one butcher, there's one bakery, there's one supermarket, there is one uh, department store where you can buy a little bit of everything. Uh, there's uh, one cloth, uh, cloth uh, boutique. But there are almost every entrance and exit of the shopping mall, there are flower stalls. Every shopping center has three, four flower stalls in all directions. And almost everybody buys fresh flowers about once a week or so. But what we also do is if we have a bad relationship with a family member or a friend because we had a conflict, we want to make up. And the thing that we almost always do when we go on a visit to talk about the conflict that we have is we pass by the flower stall and we choose a bunch of nice flowers and we bring that to our to our um, uh, we bring that with us on our visit we hold it behind our back we ring the bell or knock the door and then the door opens and there is a dark face of somebody who doesn't like to see you because there is a conflict and you say ta-da and the heart melts and you say can I please come in can you make me a cup of coffee I want to talk about what happened and you can't say no anymore you can't stay angry anymore with a bunch of beautiful flowers in front of you it's just such a powerful gesture that's the power of beauty in this case the beauty of a bunch of flowers. So, you know, we live in a world and we have all our rituals and all the things that we do, but we never really think about what's behind it. Here you start to understand it. Like the sense of pride for Muladhara Chakra. Everybody has something in their lives that you can be proud of. Of course, the middle finger is, is, if you use that in your communication, that is just very rude. But the sense of pride, something that you achieved, some competition that you won, some diploma that you got after a lot of hard work, um, any, any kind of achievement. If you remember that and you remember especially that sense of pride, it will uplift you. Then you go to the flowers or anything else, uh, something that works for you, a, a painting or, or something of beauty, something that touches you, and you go one step higher. Then you go to Manipura Chakra. Manipura Chakra, two things you know about Manipura Chakra. One is eyesight, you cover it with your index fingers, and what do you do when you talk about yourself? You point at yourself with your index finger. Ego. This is the easiest. And this is one that you can also clearly feel when you use your imagination, where you recall that somebody calls your name. You realize how powerful it is when somebody calls your name? If you are a teacher or you have children yourself, when children are, are, are misbehaving, not paying attention in the class or misbehaving in some way, distracted, they're always naughty and all over the place, but sometimes you need their attention. What do you do? You call out their name. Not just whispering, but loud. And the moment that you call out somebody's name, they erect. What? Me? Did you call me? 
and you immediately have their attention, ego. So this is what I do. I just imagine walking in the street and somebody opening a window, calling my name. Hey, run, run! <laughs> and poof, so easy. And you can feel the energy here around your diaphragm. This one is the easiest of the five chakras to stimulate. It's also the most unstable chakra that we have, the fire center. That's why we have these difficult exercises to learn to control fire, because with control of fire, we control our emotions. The fourth chakra is Anahata chakra, the heart chakra, which is related, we, we stimulate the heart chakra with a sense of Loyalty, loyalty, faithfulness. There is a reason why when we get married, we put a ring on our ring finger, in particular the left one, because it is connected with the heart. And we don't use a steel ring or an aluminium ring we always use uh, a precious metal. Why are metals actually precious? Gold, platinum, why, why are they precious? Not because they're rare. They're precious because they're sattvic. Golden jewelry, jewelry made out of precious metals, actually makes you more sattvic when you wear it. Of course, that is a subtle phenomenon, but it works. So the golden ring on the ring finger, the left ring finger, leads to sattva in the heart, which invokes a sense of loyalty. Because the heart is the, the, the center of compassion, loyalty, empathy. So, I generally, I do not use a sense of loyalty towards a person in particular. Because relationships are always complicated. If, even if you love somebody very much, there are all, there's always some, something you don't agree with or something you have uh, conflict about. Or I, 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 use the, I use the sense of loyalty towards the path that I've chosen to walk in this life, following my heart. In spite of all the obstacles and challenges that I encounter along the way, all the difficulties, the suffering that sometimes comes with it, but that's the path that I have chosen. It always proves to be the right decision, not easy, on the contrary, and I'm just very loyal to that. I'm very loyal to wanting to make this world a better place. And I express that in teaching people. And I'm not teaching people fancy exercises and perfect poses. I teach people about what yoga really is about, because that is really making a difference in people's lives. I'm loyal to that, that compassion, that, that ambition also to want, to want to make a difference in this world where there is so much violence and deceit. Loyalty. So for each individual, you have to, um, you have to explore what works for you. It can work. If you, if you are in a relationship that is just incredibly uh, stable and loving, you, you can invoke the, the image of that, 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 the loyalty that you feel towards your, um, your partner. Or you can, feel, you, you can feel loyalty towards your pet. If you have a pet, you want your pet to be happy and you, you promise your pet that you will take care of them until the end of their lives. There are many people who don't, 
but they have no heart. Their heart is not functioning. Your heart is functioning loyalty. Loyalty from your heart. You have to explore for yourself what works best for you. The last one is the, um, the thumb. Vishuddhi chakra, the throat chakra. You cover your ears with your thumbs. Why the thumbs? They are the biggest limbs on your hand. The biggest and the strongest of the five limbs is the thumb. And it represents a sense of solidity. A sense of steadfastness. Determination comes to mind. You know, people who practice yoga generally become stubborn people. Because you start doing things consciously. So you become more and more convinced. Every time that you choose to do something, you do that very mindfully, very consciously. Which means that you're also very convinced that what you are doing is the right thing to do. Sometimes you make mistakes, but until you are proven otherwise, you stick to your decision. When you're proven otherwise, you humbly admit that you made the wrong choice and you try again. That is how you learn to follow your heart. Steadfastness, the mentality to put your foot down and not give up. I have wanted, I have been in situations many times that other people might have given up. But yoga, it is because of yoga that my life changes, because of yoga that I do not, I cannot change my path. It just doesn't feel right. When I was in my 20s, I tried. Because it wasn't easy to follow my heart. Because you have to make this huge switch from what you are conditioned to think and do to a whole new approach in which everything has to be discovered, rediscovered. And that sometimes was so difficult that at some point I just tried to settle for a normal life, in a normal relationship, in a normal job. And that's when I started losing my hair and I started drinking beer and uh, very unhappy. And I just very, there, there was no other way than just to go back to the path that I had chosen when I discovered yoga. My hair didn't grow back, but I did become very happy again. Steadfastness, not giving up, regardless of the obstacles and the challenges that you come across. That is, it is an attitude. And it is an attitude that for a yogi comes natural because of mindfulness, because of your increasing consciousness. But it's also something that you can cultivate by pursuing, by by choosing, whenever challenged, to not stray away from your chosen path. Steadfastness, solidity, security. So, in the framework of our practice, you start with pranayama, followed by Sambhavi Mudra and then concentration on Nada. By the time you are done with Sambhavi Mudra, you can imagine all your energy is up and your concentration on Nada will be much improved compared to how it was before Sambhavi Mudra. If it doesn't work immediately the first time that you do it, it's just because in the beginning you are a little bit distracted by 
your exploration. You have each individual has to find uh, sentiments that work for you individually. For a sense of pride, for a sense of beauty, for ego. I have described what works for me, but what works for me maybe not necessarily works for you. If it does, okay, you can borrow it from me. But you probably have to find something that, that fits with, with your experience in life. Pride, beauty, uh, ego, loyalty and, and steadfastness. Okay, questions about this? It's just something that you need to do. It's described very elaborately in the handout. I will, when we get to the exercise, I will write it down on the whiteboard so that if you lose track in the beginning, for me it's in my memory, of course, I haven't done it thousands of times, but um, it's just, it's very elaborate. You take five different steps, five different chakras, five different sentiments. I will write it down on the board and I hope you make notes of it or you just look at the handout also, it's described here in, in the right order on page three. Um, while you are in your meditation and you lose track, you can either open an eye and look at the whiteboard to see where you are at or you look at your notes in front of you so that you don't lose track. If you've done it a couple of times, it becomes uh, it becomes a routine, it becomes something that you do uh, intuitively rather than mentally. So it will become smoother after a couple of um, repetitions. Okay, we are going to take a, long, a short break, then we do asana, and then we, before we meditate, we will also do, uh, we, we will uh, learn a new pranayama. Okay. Let's have a short break then.